All right, can you hear me all right? Give me a thumbs up. Welcome everyone to the November 2020 meeting of the Memphis Astronomical Society. We're gonna go ahead and get started here. I know there's probably a few people starting to log in. We've got a great program for you tonight. We'll get into it in just a minute. We got our very own Ann Viano, professor of astronomy at Rhodes College is gonna give us a pretty interesting presentation on some of the work that's being, that's going on over there. So first of all, I wanna welcome everyone. Hope everybody is staying uh, healthy and safe. Weather's been absolutely gorgeous. So if you have the opportunity to get out, take a walk, or if it's clear like it is tonight, get your telescope out from the driveway or whatever, take a look at the planets. Mars is still fairly close to opposition. So yeah, we don't necessarily need to be at a dark sky site to, to do some effective observing. I've, I've been staring intently at Mars for the last month or so. so it's pretty cool. So anyway, um, just a couple of preliminaries before we get started here. If you have any comments or questions, just feel free to enter them into the, the chat room in Zoom. There's a little, a little box at the bottom of the, of, the, of the Zoom call. So we would love to try to make this meeting as interactive as possible. So again, when we get into the main meeting, feel free to enter any, any questions or comments that you might have. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen now and go through a couple of preliminary slides to just kind of kick things off. So let me do that now a second. Okay, there we go. Can everybody see my slides all right here? Yes. Excellent. Okay, so again, we're the Memphis Astronomical Society. We're a nonprofit public service organization promoting interest in education and astronomy and related sciences. You can see our details on social media. For those of you who are watching on YouTube, please take a second to subscribe to this channel. And I wanna say special thanks to all of the roughly 1200 subscribers out there right now. Hope you continue to get a lot of value out of this channel. Now, if you're interested in being added to our email list, go to the website joinmas.com, enter your name and email address. We send out updates about once a week with, with regard to any meetings or events that we got coming up. Of course, it's been kind of a quiet year with COVID. We've been shut down from our live meetings since March, but we're continuing to be as active as possible, holding our meetings online. We meet the first Friday of every month and uh, we do observing sessions whenever we can, including virtual observing sessions. Talk more about that later. But yeah, join MAS.com to be added to our email list. Our website is memphisastro.org. Uh, it's got some great information on our club as well as some resources to help you um, in astronomy, including links in the upper left to anything, you know, hopefully useful on astronomy or on telescopes. We also have a calendar of events. Again, we're officially shut down due to COVID from all of our public observing sessions. But uh, check out our website, memphisastro.org, to learn more about us. Now, we got, uh, speaking of, of observing sessions, we've been, we've been participating in virtual star parties about once a month. Well, mo once a month. This is not a Memphis Astronomical Society sponsored event. It's actually hosted by the Dyer Observatory at uh, Vanderbilt University. But we've been a participant the last several months. We got another one coming up next Saturday, November the 14th. Now that is a night that one of our dark sky observing sessions is scheduled. But um, if, you know, for whatever reason you can't make that or if the weather isn't, isn't uh, favorable, then uh, you might wanna check this out. We'll send out some more information on this throughout the course of the, of the coming week. So yeah, just check it out. Uh, we got a virtual star party coming up again next Saturday. Now, Speaking of observing sessions, um, tomorrow night, the 7th of November, we are, I mean, again, officially we're shut down. Unofficially, if the weather is favorable, we open things up and we do social distancing style observing sessions. So if it's clear tomorrow night and if it's clear on the 14th, we will look to do that again. Now the weather tomorrow night does not look all that favorable. So you know, keep an eye on your email. We'll make the, the go, no-go call sometime mid-afternoon around two or so. But um, if it does happen to clear up, 
we may go ahead and try and get out and do some, some dark sky observing. This is a situation where no sharing of equipment, bring your own telescope, you know, stay a safe, relatively safe distance away from people and just get out and, you know, take advantage of our dark sky site and, and do some observing. So anyway, um, look for that tomorrow afternoon. Now, I wanna take a minute to welcome a couple of our new members that were approved at our last board meeting. And Wesley Bailey, welcome to our club. Uh, I think Wesley's on tonight. So um, unlike what has been a longstanding tradition of welcoming new members and then they don't show up to the next meeting, I guess one of the advantages of doing this via Zoom is we have a better likelihood that they actually will um, attend our meetings. So Wesley, welcome. Happy to have you on board. And Terry, also welcome to our, to our meeting. So I see some people virtually clapping. I'll go ahead and clap but uh, we're very happy to have you as new members of our society. Now, when you become a member, one of the benefits is you get access to the Meteorite, which is our newsletter. And we send this out, of course, once a month. This has got some great information, including articles from some of our members, meetings, uh, minutes from past board meetings, an astrophotography gallery. We've got some guys doing some really exciting things in the area of astrophotography, taking some just incredible photos. And then also a sky chart for the month, in this particular case, November. So be sure you check that out if you're a, uh, a paying member. So yeah, one of the perks of being a member is access to our newsletter. Now for everyone tonight, well, this is a, well really true for anybody who watches this via YouTube. I'll have links to these two documents in the description below this video. We're recording tonight. We'll, we'll post it on our YouTube channel after the live portion is over. But we got a link to the November sky chart and then also our membership application. So just look for these two documents in the description below this video. Now, if you're interested in becoming a member, just simply download the membership application, fill it out, and then email it back to us. Um, it's a PDF document. So all the fields are in there. So you just got to type them in. You don't have to do any handwriting and scanning or anything like that. Literally just download it, type in your details, email it to us at memphisastronomicalsociety at gmail.com. We'll approve it at the next board meeting and then welcome you as a new member, just like we did Wesley and Terry tonight. So we'd love to have you on board as a new member of our society. Now, November, of course, is, um, is election month. And I'm not talking about the the uh, the situation that our country's in right now. I'm talking about a more important matter, and that, of course, is the, the Memphis Astronomical Society um, elections. So every year in the summer, we, we form a nominating committee to go out and solicit interest in anybody who might be interested in serving on the board, and then also gauge interest from anybody who may want to step down from the board. So we've done that. And tonight, the nomination period officially ends. So the last three or four months, it's essentially been open with the forming of the nominating committee. We've reached out to several people and uh, would like to officially announce the four nominees who are on the docket right now to serve on the board next year. And that's Stephen Wright, Sarita Joshi, Ann Viano, and also Eileen Rudstrom. So, and in that light, we've got four people who are actually stepping off of the board. They just, they've uh, they've uh, asked for some time off and they're gonna, gonna be resigning their position. So as of right now, we do have enough volunteers to fill all 10 board positions. Having said that, before we officially close the nomination period, I would like to just take one last minute to extend an invitation, solicit interest. If there's anybody on right now, the live portion of this Zoom call that would be interested in being nominated to serve on the next on the board next year, speak now or forever hold your peace. So now would be the time. If you are interested in participating, just type your name in the chat. I'll have it open here. And then uh, we will review it at the end of the call tonight. So you don't have to make the decision right this second. We'll just give you till the end of the meeting. If no one else um, has an interest in being nominated, then basically the 10 board slots will be voted on at our next meeting, which is in December. The membership will vote on that. 
And unless we have more than 10, it will be vote by acclamation, meaning that the 10 people that have volunteered will essentially fill those spots. So pretty simple. If there is, however, more than 10 people, then we will have a voting process that we do at our next meeting. And then we will select the 10 out of the pool of, of nominees. So just think about it, but I'm happy to report that we are all set. I'm, I'm very excited for the people that have, have raised their hand and volunteered to be nominated to serve on the board next year. And uh, either way, whether we go with the 10 we currently have, or we do an official vote at our December meeting, we're gonna have a strong board next year. We're gonna continue with great programming. So there you go. Again, you're watching this live, you're on our Zoom call. And if you would like to be nominated to serve as a paying member, gotta be a paying member, just enter your name in the chat and then we will review it at the end of the call tonight. And for those of you who have volunteered your services, thank you very much. For those of you who are stepping down, hate to see you go, but thank you for your service. And I will continue to reach out to you to see if you're interested in at least consulting and uh, making, making your services available whenever it's convenient for you. So one of the things that's exciting about, you know, being a part of this organization is um, the synergy that's created when you get a lot of really smart people, creative people, energetic people um, in an organization like this to come up with new ideas. You see what happened this year with the newsletter, the Meteorite. Richard raised his hand last year and just said he wasn't happy with the current format of the Meteorite and wanted to completely give it an overhaul. He did just that and we've had uh, a pretty cool newsletter for the last year. He's stepping down this year, but Sarita has volunteered to take over in his position and has actually stepped up and is um, taking on the responsibility and the burden of learning the process that he created for putting together the meteorite. So that's kind of where we're going now. There's this transfer of knowledge from somebody who comes up with a process that makes our club better onto the next person. So hopefully we can, next year, one of the things I wanna do is try to capture that learning more so that it can be seamless whenever we, we have board members transitioning on and off the board, so. Anyway, enough about that. Uh, Jeremy. Yeah. Yes. Uh, uh, who are the nominees for officers? Mm. So President Jeremy Veldman, Vice President Observing will be Mark Matthews. And um, for Secretary Sarita Joshi and for Vice President of Programs, I don't know yet we still need somebody to volunteer to fill that role. So we're still working on that. Our vice president of programs is stepping down at the next board meeting. So all of the officer positions have been filled except for vice president of programs, but we will get that figured out. Okay, I was going to move that the nominations be closed, which is what we always do when we got a full slate. But since we don't have a full slate, I won't do that. Okay. We can make the motion at the end of the meeting. Anybody else have any comments, questions? All right. Then I'll get into the main program tonight. I'm gonna to turn it over to Ann Viano in just a minute, but uh, we got a great program tonight. Ann is a professor of astronomy at Rhodes College and they have an exciting project. And the way she's prefaced it is Rhodes College is actually going into space. A team of undergraduate students and their faculty mentors at Rhodes College are developing a CubeSat that will carry out a scientific mission in low earth orbit. As a liberal arts college without an engineering program, Rhodes has limited opportunities for students to, to participate in technology intensive education experiences. The CubeSat prod program directly addresses this limitation by providing students an exciting opportunity to engage in the new space age by create, by, uh, created by low cost nanosatellites. The, scientist, the scientific mission will test novel voltaic photovoltaic devices in low earth orbit and as a collaboration with the photovoltaic materials and devices research group at the University of Oklahoma. This presentation will discuss the process of planning and implementing a nanosatellite mission from payload selection and launch 
proposals to ground station communications. So without further ado, I would like to turn the program over to Ann. And Ann, welcome, thank you. Looking forward to this program and take it away. Well, thank you very much for uh, the open invitation for speakers. Um, I'd like to share my screen here. Give me one second. We'll see if this works. Give me a second here. Okay, can you see that? Yes. Yes, okay, great. Um, so I'm, I'm very excited to give this presentation. Um, wanted to do it a little bit earlier, but this whole COVID thing kind of put things on hold. But I'm very happy to be here tonight and, and get the word out to the Memphis community about this exciting project. And I've put here um, a picture that was on the cover of Rhodes Magazine um, back in 2013. They renovated the physics building. And I know some of you have been on campus, come to our open houses. And so you may recognize this. Um, this is actually the old building. We had two observatory domes. We now just have one observatory dome, but what we have inside is pretty exciting. It's a nice 20 inch plane wave telescope. Um, we used to have an old eight inch in here that Rick Honey once helped me colonate. And we had an archaic uh, ultraviolet scope in here or infrared scope um, that used to do eclipse hunting. But now we have one dome and a, a really nice piece of equipment in there. Um, and I should say that uh, Rhodes does not have an astronomy department. Um, it's the physics department. So I'm a professor of physics. But uh, the, the title of this magazine was that we're a galaxy of potential. So they were renovating our science facilities. And I just love this phrase, a galaxy of potential, because that's really what I think of when I think about Rhodes students, is that they just have so much potential. And if led in the right way and given the right opportunities, they can fulfill that potential. And so one way we're gonna hopefully do this is with this CubeSat project. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about satellites and CubeSats, what are they? Um, we'll talk a little bit about orbits because we've had to learn quite a bit about orbits for this project. And I think that's kind of interesting for this audience. And then you're probably wondering already, why in the world is Rhodes doing something in aerospace engineering? Why are we building a CubeSat? And then I'll talk specifically about our CubeSat, which is called RockSat. Um, I'll talk a little bit about our mission, the launch, and then I won't get into a lot of details since this is just an overview. I'll talk a little bit about the hardware and the communications, and then something that Rhodes prides itself on is involving the community. And, that's one of the reasons that I wanted to give this presentation is to get the word out about this project to the Memphis community. So as Jeremy said, I really would rather have a, a discussion as we go along than, than a lecture format. So please, if you have a question along the way, you can type it right into the chat and, and Jeremy or Freddie will interrupt me and say, hey, we have a question on this topic. Um, I would much rather have it go that way and I can speed up if we run out of time. Um, so please don't be shy about asking your questions as we go along. Okay, so I thought I would just start with a satellite that I'm sure everyone has heard of, and that is Sputnik, which was the very first satellite. It was launched in 1957, and for three weeks, it was active in its orbit. And then for two months, it didn't do anything, um, and then it, it decayed. And it was a, a satellite that was basically a large metal sphere with four antennas attached to it. It was about two feet in diameter. So here you can see it next to a, a human, so for scale. And it weighed about 184 pounds. Its orbit was at 340 miles above the surface of the Earth. And its inclination, we'll talk about this a little later, was 65 degrees. It had a radio transmitter and that was about it. And it transmitted at two different frequencies. And that's all it did. And I'm sure you will recognize this sound. I hope this works. So that was Sputnik. It made a beep and it did it around and around the earth. And it was pretty exciting for a lot of people. I think it was a little scary for people in the United States because this was launched by Russia. 
But even with just this simple scientific mission, all it did was beep. There was some science that could be done. They were able to track the satellite and from tracking its position, they were able to learn about drag that the satellite was experiencing from the upper atmosphere. And they were able to figure out some things about the density of the up upper atmosphere. All it did was beep and they were able to do all that. They were also able to determine how the signal was degrading due to the ionosphere, part of the atmosphere. And so they also learned about another part of the atmosphere. So a very simple scientific mission can yield a lot of interesting information. So let's move forward a little bit. Um, satellites have progressed. In the early 60s, Telstar went up, which it looks a lot to me like the Death Star. I don't know about you, but it looks a lot like the Death Star. Um, this was a little bigger than Sputnik, 34 inches across. Um, its altitude ranged quite a bit. Uh, it had a slightly different inclination. And this was the satellite that did the first live transatlantic television feed. So the, the age of satellite communication was really starting to take off. Then we'll progress a few years, and I'm sure everyone in this audience knows this satellite. This is the Hubble Space Telescope, launched in 1990. It is at an altitude of about 340 miles above the surface of the Earth at a lower inclination than these other satellites. And the length of the tube is about 43 feet, and the, the diameter of the mirror, I think it's a 2.4 meter mirror. We'll progress a little further. Uh, here we have the International Space Station, which is about the size of a football field. And this was begun in 1998, and its altitude is about 250 miles above the Earth's surface at a slightly different inclination. All right, so what about CubeSat? So there, there's kind of a trend here. These satellites are getting bigger, right, as time goes on. CubeSats are a class of nano satellites, so these are very small satellites. So there's a picture in the upper right here of a standard Rubik's cube, which I think everybody probably remembers. And then next to it is a CubeSat. The satellite is four inches on a side and it's cubical, so they're called CubeSats. So these are very small satellites that are cheap, inexpensive to build, well, relatively inexpensive. Um, and they can be launched into space in extra cargo space. So people are launching rockets pretty frequently these days and they don't always fill all of the cargo space. So the CubeSats were born as a way to fill that extra cargo space and basically give access to space science to the masses. They were started at Cal Poly uh, to give graduate students and college students access to space science, which is normally you know, very expensive and can only be done by big industry CubeSats are a way for other people to do research in space. And they come in different shapes and, and uh, conditions. So this would be considered a one unit because it's one cube. You can have two U, two U, two units. So this would be like two cubes put together. This is a three U satellite. So it's kind of a long and skinny. Uh, this looks like a six U. So it's three by, by two. So it's six total. And they can have different kinds of deployables. This one has a very complicated deployable antenna, some deployable solar cells. These have uh, simple deployable antennas on them, but you can get as complicated as you want or as complicated as you can afford would be another way to put it. So CubeSats started in about 10 years ago, maybe 15 years ago. And colleges and universities started getting excited because this is a cheap way for them to get to do research in space. So I wanted to talk a little bit about orbits because we had to learn a lot about orbits in order to understand uh, how this CubeSat project is gonna work. So here I have just a picture of the Earth and two different orbits. This red orbit is what is considered a low Earth orbit, so LEO. And those are orbits that have an altitude above the surface of the Earth uh, below 1,200 miles. And these orbits, uh, the International Space Station is in a low Earth orbit. Any satellite that is going to do imaging, uh, like a spy satellite, um, would have a low Earth orbit. The period of this orbit is about 90 minutes. So the satellite will make one revolution in its orbit 
every 90 minutes. Uh, if we go to much higher altitudes, 22,000 miles, we can reach what's called a geosynchronous orbit. And that's an orbit that has a period of exactly 24 hours. So it orbits the Earth at the same rate that the Earth rotates. If you put that orbit on the equatorial plane, that becomes a geostationary orbit. And so it orbits exactly at the same rate as the Earth. And you can see from this little GIF that the satellite remains fixed in position relative to the Earth. So it's always over a certain spot on the planet Earth. Uh, so this would be like a global positioning satellite, satellite TV, you know, you always have to point your satellite dish south um, because the satellite, t the t television satellites are orbiting in the equatorial plane so that they can remain over, you know, the eastern hemisphere or the western hemisphere so you can get your satellite TV. Weather satellites will do this because they want to image, you know, North America or South America, they'll have a geostationary orbit. This is a good place for me to stop and see if you have any questions. Remember, you can just enter them into the chat. Or if you want to just unmute, unmute yourself and shout it out, I'm OK with that, too. No questions yet. I do have a question. OK, this is why Ooh. I stopped. <laughs> so for these, uh, for these um, nano satellites, these cube satellites, are you just like launching multiple satellites over time and then building kind of like a matrix and then assembling them in space to form a larger um, conglomerate of, of a satellite or the, are the individual cubes the satellites themselves? The individual cube is the satellite, but as I showed you, you could have one that's the size of two cubes put together, but um, we not yet. It sounds like science fiction to launch, you know, a hundred of them and then have them self-assemble in space that might be a few years down the road. But right now the satellite is just the cube or you know the two cube, two U or three U. And because it's so small and so lightweight, you're just taking advantage of maybe the extra payload that's available on an existing rocket that's already going up there anyway, right? Exactly right. And we're gonna talk about how we're gonna get launched into space um, using that extra cargo space. Yeah, because it's extremely expensive to put mass into space. I don't know exactly what the, the figures are, but several millions or billions of dollars to launch a satellite into space. So it's, it's, it's an intriguing concept. To launch a, a simple CubeSat, it's hundreds of thousands of dollars. Wow. And, um, you know, that that's out of our price range, so to speak. It's above my pay grade. Thank you. Well, um, we're going to get to that. We're going to talk about the launch process, which is something we're, we're working on right at this moment. Um, it's a little bit stressful because it involves a big proposal, but we'll get there. So we've talked about altitude. I wanted to talk a little bit about orbit inclination. And the inclination of an orbit is simply the angle that that orbit makes with the equator. So this angle here would be the inclination angle. And there are some really interesting orbits. A polar orbit has an inclination angle of 90 degrees, and it goes above, uh, over the North and South Pole. So that can be a really interesting part of the Earth to explore or part of the atmosphere to explore. Now, as a satellite is going around in its orbit, it's, it sort of traces out a path on the Earth. And I know this is a complicated little animation. In order to visualize that path, this kind of unpacks and, and flattens the Earth out. And you'll see that the path of the satellite makes like a, an S curve on the Earth, but it's really just kind of projecting the orbit onto a flat projection of the planet Earth. So I wanted to go to this website and we can look at some interesting orbits. Hopefully, can you see, can you see this, a globe? Okay. So this is a little simulator that lets you look at different orbits. So we can look at a polar orbit, 90 degrees. And this, this simulation lets you speed it up or slow it down and you can change the altitude of the orbit, but we'll, we'll keep it at a fairly low altitude here. So here's a nice polar orbit, and the red line is tracing out where on Earth that satellite is directly above. So if that satellite were transmitting a signal, it's along that red line that you could hear that satellite or detect its signal. And so it will make these 
traces on the Earth, and you see that a polar orbit covers the entire planet. So that's kind of neat about polar orbits. However, it is expensive to get a, a polar orbit. Uh, we were talking about the International Space Station. Its inclination is about 55 degrees, and its altitude, it, it's in low Earth orbit, so it's about 1900, uh, close enough. So this is what the International Space Station's orbit looks like. And you can see that it traces out, you can kind of see this red line progressing. It traces out these paths over the planet and, and in satellite speak, they would say it's a pass. So every time it comes near your location, you would say it's, it's pass. And you know maybe on the next pass, we'll be able to hear it because it's getting closer to our location. So we will likely have um, a low Earth orbit, much like this, probably at this inclination as well, because of the way we're applying for a launch, it will probably be um, a rocket that is going to the space station. So this is very likely what we expect for our um, satellite, our CubeSat. And luckily, the paths or the passes do go right over Memphis and most of the United States. So we will be able to catch the signal from our satellite um, here in Memphis when it passes over our location. We can simulate a um, geostationary orbit. Those are at very high altitude in kilometers. It's about 35,000 kilometers. And I can zoom out, whoops, sorry. So here's a geostationary satellite and I haven't got the inclination right. We said it had to be at zero degrees. So we put it around the equator, close enough. And if we watch this long enough, we'll speed it up a little bit. This satellite is rotating at the same rate as the planet Earth. So it stays right above a certain location. It doesn't move. And on the map, all you get is a little red speck. It's hard to see, I'm afraid, but it doesn't really move on the Earth. That's a geostationary satellite. People at this location could always, 24 hours a day, reach this satellite. All right. So we've learned a lot about orbits, and we've learned that choosing your orbit is pretty important for a CubeSat. Your mission might determine your orbit, or you might choose your orbit on how likely you are to get a ride on somebody's rocket. And that's kind of what we've decided to do. So Rhodes College is gonna do CubeSat. You're probably wondering why in the world would you do this? We are a liberal arts college. We do not have a school of engineering, but we have learned over the years that when we provide students with an engaging experience, um, the, the benefits are incredible. And we have actually done a few engineering type experiences in the past. We participated in the NASA Microgravity University um, twice, and we did the NASA Great Moon Buggy Challenge a couple of times. And we learned through these projects that when students get to work together and see how a big science collaboration works and succeeds, they go off and do great things. They take so much away from that experience of getting to apply their knowledge um, that it's, it's a priceless experience for them. We're also doing this project because we had a generous gift from an alum and this alum said, I think you should do a CubeSat. And we said, yeah, that's a great kind of experience. It's kind of along the lines of what we've done before. And I think it would be really good for our students. So here we made the cover of Rhodes Magazine. Once again, uh, this was our first microgravity uh, experiment. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about this experiment because it's, it's very similar in scope to the CubeSat project. Uh, this is a picture of our moon buggy challenge and the, the NASA event is held at the US Space and Rocket Center. You have to design and build a moon buggy that is human powered and it has to complete a course at the rocket center. So they have craters and gravel and different types of surfaces that you have to get your moon buggy over without falling apart and whoever gets it done in the best time um, wins. And there are people from all over the globe at this event. Um, on our first try, we came in 11th overall and we won rookie of the year. So we were very excited about that. Um, so this is a small engineering challenge. The microgravity project was a much bigger engineering challenge. So I wanna talk about that. I think people in this audience might be pretty interested in this. Um, so you probably have heard about Isaac Newton, right? 
Uh, okay. So Isaac Newton says that if you have two masses, they're going to be attracted to each other, and that's the law of, of gravity. And he had an equation here that tells you how strong that force of attraction is. And the equation has kind of an interesting form. It has a number in it, big G, which is just a number. But then you multiply the two masses together and you divide by the square of the distance between the two masses. So R is this distance between. And Isaac Newton invented calculus so that he could do this important thing. He could say that this equation makes orbits happen. That's why he invented calculus, so that he could show that you get an orbit. And when you solve this equation, you'll find out that the orbits can be elliptical or hyperbolic or parabolic, but you actually get orbits to happen. So then Coulomb comes along and he's thinking about the attractive force between charged objects. So Q is a charge. And he looked at Newton and said, hey, that looks good. So he said that the force between two charged objects has the same form. It depends on the product of this time the charges, not the masses, and it goes as one over the distance squared. So I like this little meme because it's Coulomb kind of peeking over at Newton and then just stealing his form of the equation. But if this is true, this equation for the electric force between two charges, that says that orbits should happen. It's the exact same math to go from this equation to orbits as Newton used to go from this equation to orbits. So our microgravity team was really interested in showing that the electrostatic force would give rise to orbits. But here on Earth, the gravitational force is really huge and this electrostatic force is very small. So in order to see the effects of the Coulomb force, the force between charges, we had to get rid of the force of gravity. So how can we get rid of the force of gravity? Well, you could go into space, which would be ideal, but we couldn't do that. What we could do, though, was apply to a program that allowed us to fly an experiment on NASA's Weightless Wonder. This is a C-9B aircraft that has these unusual flights. So the red path is the flight of the airplane, and it flies these parabolas. And just like when you go on a roller coaster and you go over the, the peak of the hill, you feel weightless. So in this aircraft for about 20 seconds out of each parabola, you don't feel the effects of gravity. The blue line here just tells you what, what gravity is. Normally right now, gravity is one, but in this aircraft, when you're at the top of the hill, it's zero. The payback though is on the way up, gravity goes up to about two, and on the way down, gravity goes up to about two. So you feel twice as heavy on the way up and on the way down, but at the top, you feel weightless. So this is a way to simulate zero gravity. And this is how astronauts train for the weightless environment of space. So we had to apply to a program and proposal had to be accepted. We had to design the experiment, build it, truck it down to Houston, put it up in a, a really hot hangar in August, um, had to go through all these NASA reviews. And then when you're cleared, you finally get to install your experiment on the aircraft. The students undergo some training and the students get to fly. So not the faculty, only the students fly. So here's um, one of our students enjoying the effects of weightlessness. And there's our Rhodes Lynx, that's our mascot. So crazy. And the student you saw doing that uh, somersault actually presented at a Memphis Astronomical Society meeting back in the International Year of Light. He was a NASA ambassador for the International Year of Light. And I remember we came to a meeting and he talked about some of the things he wanted to do for that experiment or for that International Year of Light. So we did this experiment twice, actually. And so the, the idea was we will charge up some spheres and we'll see if we can get an orbit, like the Coulomb law says. So in our first experiment, one of the spheres was fixed to a frame, which was fixed to the airplane. And then one other sphere was loose and free to orbit. 
So the charge, a large charge sphere is at the center, and this is a small, a small sphere that's also charged. And he's really excited because it actually orbited just, just like we thought it would. Um, so that was actually the very first time anyone demonstrated an orbit due to the electrostatic force. Um, a couple years later, we said, well, I think we could do a better job. And this time we charged up two small spheres and we let them both be free. Rather than having one fixed to the aircraft frame, we charged up two spheres and then released them to see if we could then track the orbit. Okay, I hope you can hear the students when they're they're so excited. Yay, it worked, you know, incredible. So as far as we know, that was the very first demonstration of an orbit due to the electric force. Um, and in our work down in Houston with those experiments, we managed to talk to an astronaut who was on board just to do some, some weightlessness training. And she had said that they tried to do that on the International Space Station, but they couldn't figure out how to keep the charge on the spheres. So we felt really good that oh, we did something that NASA couldn't figure out. Um, they have since figured out a way to do that. And you can YouTube a video of uh, Don Pettit on the International Space Station has a, um, a drop of water orbiting a charged knitting needle. It's kind of a neat video. But I see we have some questions about CubeSat. So here I'm going to talk about our, our CubeSat mission. Um, so to, to get to orbit, we're applying to NASA. So NASA will hopefully orbit, uh, launch our CubeSat. And so our mission is actually has two parts. Um, there is an educational mission because NASA is all about education and that's part of Rhodes's mission as well. And then we also have a scientific mission. So our educational mission is that Rhodes students will get this great experience and, and we know that this will work. Of those students who participated in the microgravity experiment, almost half of them are now aerospace engineers. So we know that it really gets students excited and helps them define the next step after Rhodes. So there's the student experience and then Rhodes students are all about reaching out to the community. And so we have a, an, an outreach program targeted for Shelby County high schools where we're gonna go in and get them excited about space science. We also have a scientific mission. We're gonna be looking at solar cells and characterizing them in space. And this is where we're working in collaboration with the University of Oklahoma. And because we have Rhodes and Oklahoma, the students decided to name our satellite RockSat. We thought maybe Roquesat, but student says, no, it's got to be called Roquesat because Memphis is the birthplace of rock and roll. So Roquesat. So um, it's called Roquesat. We actually had an art student from Rhodes uh, design this logo. We really like it because you've got an orbit here. And then in the A for sat, it looks like an antenna. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the ground station we've been building so we can communicate with our satellite. So we're really trying to get a lot of students involved, not just physics majors. We've got computer science majors, art majors, journalism, or English majors to help us get the word out. Um, we really want this to be a campus-wide effort. Now, someone had asked about the duration and the, the burn up. Um, CubeSats will completely burn up on reentry. They are not out there forever, not contributing to space debris. Um, it will last about one year at the altitude uh, that we're planning and then it will completely burn up. And NASA is very particular that you have a complete re-entry plan so that nothing will make it to the surface of the earth. You cannot use titanium screws or brass because they will not completely burn up. So everything has to be a material that will dissipate. Okay, so how do we get to space? So this is where we're we're going to go through another NASA program. We've had success so far with microgravity and moon buggies. This one is called the NASA CubeSat Launch Initiative. And basically, it means that NASA will launch your CubeSat on one of its rockets for free. And that's fantastic because we can't afford a launch. 
as much as our students would love to launch a rocket from the Rhodes College campus, it's not gonna happen. <laughs> so the launch in initiative, it provides opportunities for small satellite payloads built by universities, high schools, NPOs, to fly on upcoming launches. Most of these are rockets that are going to the International Space Station. They are resupply missions and they go pretty frequently and there's extra space. So they put CubeSats on these rockets. It is a competitive award. Um, we're getting close to the submission deadline. Uh, it's mid-December. And it's a really interesting kind of proposal because NASA has you select your own reviewers. So we have had to choose our own reviewers to do sort of a friendly review and give us feedback. And then we can edit the proposal before final submission. And we are in that, that sort of friendly review period right now, um, getting some feedback about our proposal. Uh, we will find out in April if we are accepted in this cycle of the program. And if we are accepted in April 2021, we need to be ready to go about a year later. So once we find out, it's, it's all pedal to the metal. We got to get ready. Um, in the background here is one of NASA's launches for CubeSats. This was um, in 2013, just a, a nice example. And of course, the students are very excited that we will go to the launch and actually watch our CubeSat take off. Now, sometimes bad things happen. Um, recently, Rocket Labs was launching um, 17 CubeSats and the rocket failed on launch. So all those CubeSats were lost. Uh, we hope nothing like that happens. You, you just have to deal with problems as they arise. That would be a serious problem. All right, so the launch mechanism um, for NASA, they use something called nano racks, and it's just a, a device that holds CubeSats in a little uh, module. So here you can see a 1U CubeSat, that would be like ours, a 2U, a 4U, bigger CubeSats. They attach to this sort of T-like structure, and then they are packed into a, a little module here that then can be attached to, in this case, the space station. And when they open it up, a little spring ejects the CubeSats. So here they are. These CubeSats have just been launched and they will go off on their orbit. And since they're being launched from the space station, they will have a very similar orbit to the space station. However, the very best way to have your CubeSat launched is by a, um, an astronaut. And so this is a CubeSat from Brazil being launched by a cosmonaut who basically throws it out of the space station. So he's on a spacewalk. You can see his arm here. And this green thing is the CubeSat. And he's just going to throw it. Uh, Peru, sorry, this was from Peru. Cast it away for its uh, science mission in orbiting the Earth. Yes, we're trying to make sure that Earth is in the viewfinder zone. One, two, three. So there it goes, off into space. And the way it goes. So our students would really like it if our CubeSat was launched by an astronaut. They just think that's really cool. However, if you noticed what the astronaut did when he launched that was he put all this spin on the CubeSat. And in the satellite world, that's terrible. You don't want a lot of tumbling in your satellite because you have to get rid of that. So I would like the astronauts to be trained a little bit more on how to launch it without any spin, but um, it still would be cool, I think. Okay, so we decided we're gonna do this. We're gonna apply to NASA for a launch, great. We need a plan, right? So we started meeting in fall 2019. Every week we would have a room full of very excited students. Uh, this is Julia, just so excited about CubeSat and we would start thinking about mission ideas. What are we gonna have this CubeSat do? We're in a very unusual situation. Normally you have a, an experiment that you want to put in space and then you've got to figure out how to get to space. We have the resources to get to space through this generous gift and hopefully through NASA. Now we have to design an experiment to do in space. So we spent a lot of time with students, uh, just a think tank. Every idea that came to mind, we put it on the whiteboard and we, we did this over and over and over until we could narrow it down. 
no idea was too crazy. So there's some really cool stuff up here. Inflatable heat shield. I like that. They actually do have those now. Um, a drag sail. Uh, there's things about rainforest recovery. There's a whole section on environmental projects. So students were saying, well, what if we could image the rainforest and measure how much green there is and see how the rainforests are recovering from the devastating fires they had earlier in 2019. Um, looking at chlorophyll and algae, uh, maybe looking at cloud density. Uh, we had some acoustics ideas, looking at space junk. Um, here it is, micrometeorites was an idea that persisted for quite a while. We thought we could put up a, a sensor that would detect micrometeorite impacts and we could measure how many micrometeorites there are at a certain orbit. So lots and lots of ideas. Um, this went on through the next semester until COVID hit and then we went all online. But at that point, we had narrowed it down to a couple of ideas. Okay, so our idea that one, the, the scientific mission has to do with solar cells. And so everybody knows what a solar cell is. A lot of satellites and spacecraft will use solar panels to power the spacecraft. They just convert radiation, usually light, visible light, but sometimes infrared or ultraviolet. They convert that into electricity. But space is actually kind of a dangerous place. Once you get beyond the Earth's protect protective magnetic field, there are all kinds of hazards for materials. So hazardous electromagnetic radiation, and hazardous radiation in terms of particles. You have high energy protons whizzing through space coming out of the sun. You have dangerous gamma rays and x-rays. All that type of radiation damages materials, especially electronics, uh, and it can be pretty serious. So there are groups that are working on new types of solar cells that will resist the degradation that happens in space. So we have partnered with the University of Oklahoma through sort of a chance meeting at a conference. I, I toured their lab and they were doing space solar cells and we were doing CubeSat and it just kind of worked out. Um, they are looking at new types of solar cells. Some are flexible solar cells. Some are materials that have a different atomic structure that can be more resistant to radiation damage. So our scientific mission is going to be characterizing solar cells in orbit, which is pretty exciting. So we will be able to see if any degradation happens to the solar cells over the course of our mission. Oops. And I'm not going to get into a lot of the details here, but to characterize a solar cell is a pretty simple measurement. You put a voltage across the cell and you measure the current and you get something like this red curve and the shape of that red curve can tell you a lot about the performance of the solar cell. This blue curve here is just showing the power from the solar cell and there's some point where the cell gives you the maximum power. So we want to perform this test, these current voltage tests in orbit, which is pretty exciting because it should show us how these solar cells decay with time or, or degrade. So a little bit about our, our hardware, our rock sat will look something like this little schematic in the upper left. It's a frame that's about a little bit bigger than a Rubik's Cube and it's layered with different computer boards. We will have deployable antennas like this at the bottom. And if we look inside the frame sort of from the side view, there's a tiny little space for our payload. That's our experiment. And then we have a board that is our onboard computer. That's sort of the brain of the, the CubeSat. Then we have another board that is all about communications. So it's a, a radio receiver and transmitter. Then we have a large board here. That's our electrical power system. And there are large batteries here so that when the CubeSat is in the dark and not getting power from the sun, uh, we have some power. Then we have something called a magnetorker. There are actually three of them. And this is what we use to, to detumble the satellite. So if an astronaut launches our CubeSat and gives it a nice spin, like a, a spin a spitball or something, uh, we will hopefully be able to use these magnet torquers to detumble and get it a little bit more stable. And then at the bottom are these little antennas that will pop out so that we can listen to our CubeSat. Um, the outer casing will be solar cells. 
And most of them will be solar cells that power the satellite, but one half of one face, so about this much of one face will be our actual test solar cells. And we're looking at having about eight different solar cells and we will perform those electrical measurements on these eight different solar cells. Um, hey, Ann, I've got a quick question. Yes. So is your onboard computer, is that a Raspberry Pi? Um, no, we are purchasing our hardware from a company called Innovative Solutions in Space. They're, they're based out of the Netherlands. Um, and we're purchasing these pieces from them because they all work together. There are CubeSats that run on Arduino or Raspberry Pi, but that's not really space tested hardware. And right. NASA is very particular. If you're gonna put something in space, you wanna have it space hardy. Um, I think a Raspberry Pi might not last very long in a, <laughs> high, a high orbit, but I, I have seen CubeSats with Raspberry Pis and Arduinos. That's cool, all right, thanks. So our payload here has little places for the test solar cells. And then we have this module, which is um, a little microprocessor that a leading industry in the aerospace field has donated to us. So we will have eight of these little AMU modules to actually perform the IV measurements. Um, we have to program them from our computer. It will talk to this module and then it will perform the measurements on the solar cells. Okay, so we've, we've got our satellite. It's gonna do some science in space. That's all great, but we have to be able to communicate with our satellite in order to get the data, right? So we have been very busy at Rhodes building a radio station to listen to our satellite and to transmit to our satellite. So we saw a picture of Rhodes Tower earlier. We have the observatory on the south end, and now on the north end, we have a big antenna that connects to a control room a few floors down, and that is our, our command center, right? And so we are using this antenna and a radio to talk to satellites. And we're in the learning process, but our antenna is a, a big Yagi antenna because it looks like a Y. Um, we have in the control room, this is a, a transceiver, which is, this is something a ham radio operator might have. A, Ours is an ICOM 9700, but it's something a ham radio operator would buy and hook up to their antenna to, to do ham radio. We can control the antenna. Uh, we can cause it to rotate. It can rotate in two axes here to track a satellite. And then we have a giant screen, of course, because we want to be like NASA and we want to have the big command center. Um, and here we can see some satellite software we're using to track a satellite. Um, our radio, we're actually transmitting on the 70s, uh, we're transmitting to the satellite on the two meter band and we're receiving from the satellite on the 70 centimeter band. These are ham radio frequencies. And so about five of us have already gotten our ham radio license so that we will be able to transmit to our satellite. Um, anybody can listen, but if you want to transmit, you have to have a license and we will have to do some license paperwork in order to be approved to do this experiment through uh, the ham radio, American AMSAT. That's what. So satellite tracking is pretty cool um, if you can get everything to work right. It's a lot of interfacing. So we have this piece of software called SatPC and it tracks satellites. So this uh, shows a map of the world, kind of like we saw earlier. The little tiny X here is on Memphis, Tennessee. And then there's this white circle with a bigger X. That is a satellite that we were tracking. So this satellite was AO91. This was actually a, a ham radio satellite called FoxRad put up by Vanderbilt um, to allow ham radio operators to talk through a satellite. So in this demo, we were tracking this satellite and our, our satellite tracking software interfaces with our radio so that it automatically tunes the radio to the correct frequency. So satellites are kind of weird. They're, they're, well, not weird, but they're moving and they're moving so fast that the frequency shifts. Just like when you hear a, a police car coming towards you, the pitch goes up. And then when it goes away from you, the pitch goes down. That's the Doppler shift. Satellites do the same thing. So the frequency that they're transmitting on changes as they pass overhead. And so by having some satellite tracking software, 
it automatically calculates the, this Doppler shift and feeds it to your radio. So you don't have to try to keep up with this Doppler shift. Uh, we had a camera so we can actually watch our antenna move as it tracks the satellite across the sky. And the day we were doing this particular demo, it was very rainy. Um, so it's kind of a mess. But we have learned how to listen to satellites. We've had success transmitting to a satellite and getting our signal back. Um, now it's just a matter of fine tuning the system and making sure we're tracking things accurately. And eventually when our little CubeSat is launched and in orbit, we will feed that orbit data into the software so that we can track our satellite. All right, I had told you that part of our project was community outreach because that's what road students love to do. And we think it's really important to inspire the next generation. So part of our project is an outreach project and we have called it PV cells and gravity wells because it waxes poetically off the tongue. But it's basically two different projects. We hope to go into the Shelby County, maybe middle schools, definitely high schools with these two different projects. One is very hands-on, so it's kind of a lab for students. The other is more of a, a demonstration. So a teacher could choose what fits best in his or her classroom. Uh, the, the solar cell project will have students measuring the current coming out of a solar cell, just like we're gonna do in space. And they're gonna look at the effects of the wavelength of light, or how does shading of the solar cell affect the output? Or what about the angle of the sun or the light hitting the solar cell? Is that going to affect the output or what different kind of loads in the circuit? So our students are going to build these little boards and, and build this kit and then we can take it into the schools and hopefully get the future scientists all excited about this. Um, the second one is more of a demo and this will use spandex to demonstrate gravity. This is a great demo for a lot of physics classroom. This is a giant hoop of spandex and you can use that to demonstrate gravity because it acts like space time. So you can use spandex, you can throw some marbles or large masses on the spandex and it will make a gravitational well. And we can talk to students about how the sun makes a big gravitational well. And if you toss some marbles on the spandex, they will orbit that gravitational well. So we can talk about orbits. We can show them that some orbits are stable, others are not so stable. We can even show complex orbits. If you do this just right, and we're, our students are gonna practice, you can get a moon orbiting a planet while the planet is orbiting the sun. And you can get some transfer orbits like Apollo 8. It's pretty exciting. You can also demonstrate gravity waves, and that's what's being shown here. This is just a hand drill with a piece of wood with two balls on the end and it spins around and simulates two neutron stars merging and how gravity waves propagate on the spandex. We also came up with a way, I'm really excited about this, to demonstrate warp drive on spandex. I think the students are gonna love that. So I'm pretty excited about that. So timeline, this is the last slide here. Um, this is a big project. This is much bigger than microgravity. Uh, we started early in you know, mid 2018. We had a search for someone to direct our project, which apparently, which unfortunately was unsuccessful um, because the aerospace industry is hiring right now and the job market is very good there. Uh, we had a steering committee and then we started defining our payload. And then COVID hit about here. So things kind of slowed down, but we have been working on our ground station and it's almost complete. We're just in the optimizing phase. We're working on the application to NASA. So here we are. That application goes in in a month and we will hear in April whether or not we're accepted. We have purchased our hardware and it should arrive in January. So we're well into this phase. There's a lot of training that goes on and um, all of the software that we're going to use. It's a sort of special operating system. We're going to have to learn that. Um, the payload is being developed. We have a long way to go to integrate all of the pieces. Um, I'll skip down here. Uh, more training. Uh, this is training by the, the company that is providing our hardware so that we can write the flight software. Software development, that's going to be a big chunk. 
And then there's a piece that's FCC licensing. We have to get approved before we can transmit to our satellite. Then there's design reviews. And then there's testing. The CubeSat has to be tested extensively so that it will survive the launch. So the launch has a lot of vibration, maybe some heat. You have to do all kinds of testing before you can be manifested onto a, a rocket. Um, there's some environmental testing, that's vibration testing, heat testing. We'll be doing that at um, Moorhead State in Oklahoma, uh, in Kentucky. Uh, they have a facility there that we can use to do the testing. Then hopefully by May 23, uh, we're ready for launch, blast off, and then that's when the science begins. And hopefully we monitor our satellite until it decays about a year later uh, and we get all that good scientific data that can uh, reveal something interesting about solar cells. So that's where I'll stop. And I, I hope it was interesting to you. Um, if, I, if there are, are some questions, I'm happy to try and respond. Thank you, Ann. We, we do have a couple of questions. Um, so we, one question we had was, do you expect the public to listen to the satellites once they're launched in an orbit? Well, that's a great question. And I know we have some ham operators in this group. We would love for these ham operators to come and help us. Um, the data that comes down will be encoded. So it comes in data packets and you would have to know how to unpack the data packet. Um, but yeah, you can listen to it. You can listen to the International Space Station right now. Um, I've been listening to satellites since I got my antenna this summer. Um, and it's kind of fun to listen to their beeps and the ham radio satellites. You can hear people talking with voice through these ham radio satellites. So sure, those frequencies are open to any ham radio operator who has the equipment. Go ahead and listen. Just out of curiosity, what do you typically hear? I'm not a ham radio operator. Um, from a satellite, you would just hear beeps, boops. You, it wouldn't make any sense. It's not voice data. Uh, it's not like Star Trek, unfortunately. It's not voices, but um, you would be able to see that there is a signal, and we will record that signal, and then we will unencode it, and that will be our data. Gotcha. It'll sound like a, a modem or a fax machine, something similar to that. <clears throat> yes. Cool. Um, we had another question also about the decay of the orbit and how that's addressed with CubeSat. So the CubeSat has to decay and, and how long an object lasts in orbit basically depends on the altitude. Um, the International Space Station would decay except that it, every once in a while it gives a thrust so it remains in orbit. But these CubeSats will just decay in low Earth orbit. They last about a year and then they will decay and they have to completely burn up in the atmosphere. Nothing can, can reach the ground. So there's basically a slow orbital decay due to friction, if you will, yes. from the, the upper atmosphere of the Earth? Yeah, all satellites will decay over time. Um, the, farther, the higher they are, the longer they'll last. But if you want them to last forever, you have to put some thrusters on there. And we're not gonna have thrusters on this CubeSat. That's a level of complexity we're not quite ready for. Yeah, I see. I do have a question, but I just I just happened to notice here in your slide that um, the training for this project is being um, is being performed by ISIS. And I just <laughs> wonder if I get a little clarity on that. Yeah, we've gone around and around. ISIS is Innovative Solutions in Space. And okay. They are, they are based in the Netherlands, and they are a group that makes space hardware for CubeSats and um, we, we like this company because they were formed by university students. So they're really friendly to students and they want to help us. They provide a lot of training. Um, they will probably do what well, we had talked about going to the Netherlands for training and the students were really excited about that. But I think now it will all be virtual training. <laughs> That's good. I appreciate the clarity. I was having, having a couple of questions there. Yeah, um, we went yeah. round and round about that too. And, and they, they are now more specific. It's ISI space or something. <laughs> Catchy acronym and just uh, maybe a bad association. Um, so, wait a minute. I think we had one other question here. 
Yeah. Can you share the budget data and how much the satellite hardware costs? Yes, this question is from my brother. Thank you, Thomas. <laughs> um, so we're looking at a budget of about $500,000 for this whole project. The satellite hardware itself, um, probably about half of that. The launch, we're hoping the launch is free through NASA. If the launch is not free, we're gonna to have to find some more money <laughs> to, uh, to actually launch this. I hear you. Can you also talk about some of the potential commercial or industrial applications, maybe looking long-term? I mean, uh, some of the experiments that you're gonna be performing are testing the uh, photovoltaic cells in zero gravity. But um, I guess looking long-term beyond the the uh, space exploration aspect of it. What are the potential commercial um, applications of some of the knowledge that will be gained by this experimentation? So this particular experiment is, is looking at solar cells that are being developed for space applications. So this group in Oklahoma is looking at space missions to the outer solar system. So these solar cells have to be very hardy in order to, to persist long enough to get to Jupiter or out to the outer solar system. So we're really just characterizing these materials to help them make better materials to make better solar cells for space. Gotcha. That kind of leads into my next question. But before I ask it, um, anybody else has any other questions, of course, just feel free to enter them into the chat. But that kind of um, kind of leads to my next question. Do you kind of see this as the, the future of space exploration, not necessarily these larger probes like um, New Horizons and some of the other ones that we've been sending, but some of the smaller nano nanosatellites, not only for low earth orbit, but for exploring the outer reaches of the solar system, cube size satellites, and maybe even going beyond because they're so much smaller and easier to, uh, to propel. So what do you see as far as the future of exploring our solar system? Uh, I think they will take off. In fact, um, CubeSats were used to communicate with the Chinese lunar lander. Um, they had some CubeSats on the backside of the moon that were used to communicate with the lander and then back to Earth. There were a couple of CubeSats on a recent Mars mission that were again used as sort of a communication node to objects on the surface. So I see them being used more and more and people are now working on small constellations of CubeSats that can work together. I've even seen a CubeSat that is a telescope, which I think is really cool. If you have several CubeSats together, they could act as a big telescope in space. Yeah, and I think I may have read somewhere, somebody correct me if I'm, I'm, I'm a little ignorant on this, but even the potential for sending a nanoprobe as far as Alpha Centauri, if you could accelerate it to a a significant fraction of the speed of light. Obviously, it's a lot easier with something that's small rather than something that's much larger. Still would take several years to get there, but it wouldn't take like centuries. So I don't know. Any other questions? Quite a bit. Okay, thank you, Ann. Um, any other closing remarks? It's a really exciting project. I'm very curious to see this in full implementation. So well, April we'll of 2021. <laughs> As we go along, we'll try to update the group here. Looks like the next milestone is next April. Yes. Is that correct? Yes, Antonio. we find out from NASA. We're, we're fairly confident because we're a small college and undergraduates are involved. Oklahoma is one of very few states that has not participated in a CubeSat. So I think NASA will look favorably on our proposal. Excellent. Well, that's very exciting. So early stages of this project. Yeah, there was, Oklahoma is providing materials, the, the, the actual photovoltaic cells that they're testing. Yes, that's correct. That's their role in it. Correct. They are providing the, the solar cells that we are going to then put on the CubeSat. Any other questions, comments? Or as one of my professors once said, cussing and discussing. 
and I'm a ham radio operator. So if I can help in any way, I'd love to. Well, we actually need a ham operator advisor. So I may be looking you up here. <laughs> All right. All right, excellent. Okay, to kind of wrap up here, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and just share my screen for just a brief moment. And thank you again. Welcome to the board. We are very excited. I'm personally very excited to have you on board next year. It's gonna be a great year. So uh, this is a very content rich presentation. Very exciting to see what, what other projects are being, are being developed and worked on throughout the community. So excellent presentation. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for the invite. Okay, um, just a couple things here to wrap up. So, whoop. again, I'll have links to these two documents in the description below this video. Those of you who are interested in getting out and doing some backyard astronomy, our November sky map showing the constellations, and of course, our membership application if anybody's interested in joining. Um, and then, of course, this is just the links to some more information on our, on our organization, our website. You can find us on Facebook. We have a group. Subscribe to this YouTube channel. This is, we'll, we'll post this on YouTube when it's over. Uh, Twitter, we, we try to send updates there as well. And, of course, joinmas.com is uh, the website to go to if you'd like to join our email list. So, um, again, you know, the nomination period is basically coming to an end. For anyone who is interested in serving on the board, we have 10. We'll officially vote. The members will officially vote at the December meeting. All positions are filled. We have nominations for all positions. Again, technically we're looking for a vice president of programs, but we will get that figured out. So um, yeah, that's kind of where we stand. So, so Bill, if you wanna move that we close the nominations, now would be a good time. So move. I All right. Well, then we will officially close the nominations and vote at the December board meeting, which essentially will be a vote by acclamation. So pretty simple procedure this year. Um, that is it. So I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen here. And again, tomorrow night, if it's clear, we'll send a notice out regarding observing likely you know we'll see what the weather is like and then next week also if it's clear on the 14th of november then we will look at probably doing an observing session then as well we also have a virtual star party so keep an eye on your email so either way next saturday november the 14th um a dark sky observing site session at burton's if it's clear and or well and a, uh, a tennessee statewide virtual star party so that's what we've got coming up our next meeting is going to be the first Friday in December. This is a good one, guys. We do every year around the holidays, we discuss telescopes and kind of our December meeting is dedicated to buying your first telescope for Christmas. We will have a discussion, really a kind of a, I believe it's a, a debate this time around on some of the different ideas and recommendations for telescopes. If you're interested in buying a telescope, for Christmas or buying your first telescope. So that's coming up in December. And then we follow it up in January with how to set up and use your, your new Christmas telescope. Again, we're kind of doing it virtually this year because of COVID, but um, first Friday in December, that's our next meeting. We'll send a, a notice out soon regarding that. So keep, it, keep an eye on for that. And that's pretty much it. Again, our website is memphisastro.org. Go to uh, joinmas.com if you wanna join our email list. And just want to thank everybody again for taking the time to log on tonight. We'll have the recording on YouTube soon. And everybody stay safe and healthy. And we'll see you at our next meeting.